Okay, Ty Edwards, I'm back here again. We've got another panel, so I'm really excited. We're going to use the same format for questions that we used in the previous one because we could get through so many and it was really efficient. So this panel is called What's at Stake? Organizing for Political Action. And we are so excited to have these three folks with us because they have a lot of experience and they're going to give us some great ideas and actions to take. Uh, so first we have Dr. Barbara Bollier, who you may remember. <laughs> Dr. Bollier is a uh, physician and a politician and a former run for uh, U.S. Senate, as you may remember. You might have that yard sign. No also. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, so Dr. Bollier is here representing organizing uh, and her organization Prairie Roots, which she will tell us about. And Davis, I realize I have your microphone. I will give it to you in a second. Sorry, Daniel, I'm using two microphones. Uh, so Davis Hammond is with us today, president of Loud Light. Yeah. And you may remember Christina mentioned Davis when she was giving her remarks. Uh, I mean, there's so many things to say about Davis. So organizing across the state, uh, and I really appreciate the focus on youth. I think this is really important in Davis's work. Also very social media uh, engaged, and this is really wonderful. Also on TikTok. I know many of you are as well, so you could watch Davis there. And then we have um, a record-setting leader here with us today with Janice Vasquez, who is the first Latina ever elected to the Liberal City Commission. <laughs> so, Janice, so Janice, we really appreciate your leadership in this. This is a really important um, step, and this is going to pave the way for many others, uh, women and other Latinas and Hispanic folks in our state. All right, so we are excited to hear from them, and we are just going to go down the line. So, Barbara, we'll start with you, and we're going to hear from each one of them, and then we'll do questions like we did before. So, Barbara, take it away. Thank you so much. And I prefer to stand, I think, better on my feet. <laughs> <laughs> so it is truly, it is not only an honor, but it is a pleasure to be here with you today because I love Kansas. I love our state, I love the people, and I care deeply about what happens in this state. I didn't lose an election, or as the Kansas City Star likes to say, a failed candidate. <laughs> I won my election because I did what needed to be done. I maintained integrity and honor and put out for the people a choice. So the question that was asked earlier to the governor, what advice do you have to women about running? Run, for God's sake, run. <laughs> we need you because we do those things and it really, really matters. If you've met some of the people that are in office, whether it be at the state house or the national level or locally, you'll go, my God, I could do that. <laughs> <laughs> because you can run a household. And they probably couldn't do that either. No <laughs> names mentioned. But do that. It does matter. So when I ran and after it, the campaign, uh, I didn't end up in Washington. I looked around and said, well, how do we keep moving? How do we build on what was created with the campaign we ran? Which really was great. And thank you for all the help. What could we do? And I said, where in this world, where have they been successful in changing the outcomes in a state? And we needed to look no further than Stacey Abrams in Georgia. Yes. Two Senate seats changed the state of this country because of Stacey Abrams and her work with Fair Fight. <laughs> so. We don't have fair fight in Kansas. We have Prairie Roots, Kansas. We started it to emulate, and myself, Peyton Browning, Peyton, raise your hand. She's our executive director. She was on my campaign team. And former Representative Brett Parker got together and said, this is what we need to do to help Kansas change and be a more progressive state with our elected officials. And just so you know, that's how we got started. So, <laughs> what do we know about women in Kansas? We have to fight 
back. We have to do this. What's at stake? Well, the two things that came up in a question, our governor did not mention them in her speech, but we'll start with August, an abortion elimination amendment to our Constitution. That is That affects every person in this state. Not only the women, but the men. Because ultimately, if you take away the right to choose and our bodily autonomy, it doesn't necessarily stop with abortion. Those people will tell you they want to end birth control. They believe that a birth control method causes an abortion. It doesn't matter what the facts are. Boy, have we learned that they don't care about <laughs> facts. They will vote and take those things away, and they'll also take away IVF. We need people to have choices and to maintain their bodily autonomy, and those things are going to be gone. And I will tell you this, for those of you who have had sex in their lives, it's a pretty good thing. <laughs> And I know most men want us to be having that, and if there's no birth control, it's going to impact them. So you can use that on your doorstep and with your partners, because by God, it does matter, and we like to plan things. The other is why I have on this orange jacket. Our children are dying, and that is not okay. And in this state, we even have a state senator that's willing to go online and say that it's about the NRA, and for God's sake, that we need our guns out in rural Kansas to shoot snake. Show me and anybody that needs an AR-15 to worry about a snake on the ground. Forgive me, BS. I will call. We must stand up and have our votes count. And the only way we're going to do that is to flip our legislature. We know how much is it at stake. You've already known that. It continues. Yes, under our governor, we're doing a great job. And we're building our economy. But there are key, key issues that are not being addressed. For instance, as we've discussed earlier, Medicaid expansion. And I have the ability, because I'm not running, and I'm not in a position that I have to protect what I say. There is a gentleman from this city, Dan Hawkins, who is standing in the way of Medicaid expansion in the state. And anything to do to get someone else to win in that district will really matter. And I will call him out, and I hope they put it in the paper, and I hope he needs to call me, because I will call him on it. But that's what we need. We need people who will stand up and fight for what is right, and we need to elect those people. You have to get involved. This is your state. You are leaving the state to people in the future. When Governor S Kelly was asked about capers, she was talking about 1970s and 80s. Someday, people are gonna be sitting around just like this talking about now and what was done. And I would like to know, and I hope you do too, that they're gonna be talking about what all the women in this state did to help it change. You have to take that responsibility. Let me tell you a little story. This morning, as we left our hotel, we got in the elevator and there was a woman, one of the people who cleans at the hotel was in there. And she said, oh, what are you doing? And immediately I said, well, I'm speaking at Women for Kansas and did you know that there is a constitutional amendment on the ballot? All right, the doorstep is not just at someone's door. The doorstep is wherever you are standing and whoever you are with. And you know what, what's the worst thing that could be happening? What, what could happen the worst thing if you mention this? They don't wanna talk to you. Oh well, <laughs> guess what? She knew, she's voting no, and I gave her a card and said, please help every woman know about this and people you know. And that's my charge. 
I did it on the airplane to the two people I sat with. <laughs> I do it in, in anywhere you go. We have to do this. It's not just about the amendment, but it is about this amendment because everything will change if we do not vote no and get that to change. There are 59 days left till that vote. So you can't be shy, it's now. Make it happen. A sign is great, but conversation between people is what matters. And you just can't be shy about it. This is not the time to be in the polite, no religion, no politics. It is religion and it is politics. And I want my freedom of religion and I want your freedom of religion, whether it's to choose not to have an abortion or to, that should be our choice. So, back to Prairie Roots. We identified the fact that this state can flip its legislature. Data matters, we looked at the data. Our job at Prairie Roots is to turn out non-voters who are already registered to vote. They're easier. They've already done the hard work of registering and connecting with them. And we've identified 240,000 of those voters. That's not many. <laughs> and we have identified that 180,000 of those non-voters but registered are under the age of 35. That will lead to Davis later. <laughs> But point being, we can do this. We have identified five key areas that we can specifically flip, going from conservative to progressive. As we've been doing this, we, we phone bank every Wednesday. Our website is prairierootskansas.com. Write it down, I'll say it three times. <laughs> prairierootsks.com. You can volunteer. Every Wednesday, we have reached um, 70,000 70, people we have reached out to. And out of the people that we've connected with, 70% of them have said, I will vote in August. That matters. There are more out there and we need your help. You can donate to us. If you don't wanna make phone calls or help text, you can go door to door in your neighborhoods and do what's called deep canvassing. What's different about a person canvassing for a candidate or a person canvassing with Prairie Roots? The difference is, is we do not represent a candidate or a platform, whatever. We ask the person, what matters to you? What can government do for you? And I will tell you, that people you talk to, when they find out, what it, when we find out what it is that they need and they want, almost universally, what they need or want will be provided by a progressive candidate or a progressive idea. And helping them see that relationship, establishing a relationship with them over time and helping them know that government is for them is how you bring them in. It's different, but it works. It's what they did in Georgia. It is a long-range plan, but by 2026, did you hear that? It's already 2022 and a half, right? <laughs> we could change our legislature so that it's more progressive. Right here in this area, District 96 represented, the representative district, we don't have a candidate. One of you might live there. You could run. No matter what I've always tell, told people, it is not just about whether you win the election or not. It is about giving people a choice. And many times, people are surprised because the choice then becomes someone you and I would support. And that is what matters, and we must, must do that. If you aren't willing to one help recruit someone else to run. I will disagree just a tiny bit with our governor. <laughs> when I first ran and uh, 
Stephanie Clayton, represented, Representative Stephanie Clayton. She was a very young woman. And I thought, oh my gosh, why would someone do this when they're so young, they haven't had experience, blah, blah, blah. And I remember her statement was, you know, that voice deserves as much to represent the people, that voice needs representing, as well as old gray women and lots of older white men. We need that voice there. So you may be the one. It doesn't, your experience may have come from living through watching your parents or whatever, but don't be afraid and reach out to others who have run. Any of us will help you, any of us will. Information about House District 96, it is one, it is our top, in our top five of flippable districts. Meaning it takes very few votes to change, to get out, to make it become progressive. So no, again, prairierootsks.com, come to us, support us financially, volunteer, tell others about it. That is how you change a state's direction. You have to change who's elected. We can talk and we can get together and do the kumbaya and try to get along, but ultimately it comes down to a vote. And when you have a majority leader that's holding people, uh, saying if you vote this way, then you won't be on a committee or you won't lead a committee or whatever it is, we're never going to get there just by talking. We've got to get the vote out. Join me. Join all of us. Join Women for Kansas. Talk to people. Every chance you get, there are 59 days. The outcome of what goes on in this state is so much going to matter about August 2nd. So thank you for having me today. I'm going to turn it over. I don't know if you're introducing next or just then. I've known Davis since he started. <laughs> and I know he won't mind me saying this. I supported him heavily in the beginning. Because if you don't have accurate information going out to the public, it doesn't matter what happens. And this man took it upon himself, thank God, and has been doing that. And uh, we owe him a great deal. So Davis, take it away. Um, all right, so I might sit as I do this. And whenever I saw you get up, I think I had a flashback. To, I think it was a 2020 debate where y'all had chairs and then you stood up. And then I think you saw it in Roger's eyes, like, oh gosh, we're going to have to stand up every time we talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so uh, my name is Davis Hammett, and I moved to Kansas in January of 2013. And I came here to help create the Equality House, which is a house painted rainbow directly across from the Westboro Baptist Church hate group. <laughs> I'm originally from North Florida, which I say North Florida because I'm from a place that uh, is known as the Redneck Riviera. So not, not Miami. I'm from maybe your stereotype of Lower Alabama. Uh, and I like to say I wanted to go somewhere progressive, so I came to Kansas. <laughs> but so uh, in 2013 when I moved here, and I honestly thought I was just going to come here for a couple months. I was 22 years old. I was going to come here for a couple months, do that project, and then leave. Uh, I didn't really know where Kansas was on a map. <laughs> I, was, I was pretty terrified. Um, I had lots of kind of stereotypes about what Kansas was. And one thing that immediately got me was how wrong my stereotypes were. That I understood there were terrible things happening under the Brownback administration here. But when I got here, even stopping and talking to the gas station clerk or anyone, no one seemed to agree with what was happening. And so I didn't understand how it was happening. <laughs> so we launched the house. I'm getting more and more involved in the community doing activism here. And one thing that I actually feel really blessed about is, um, you know, 2013 was a really rough time if you were trying to get involved in the state. There was a 
kind of uh, burnout that had happened. A lot of people weren't engaged. People who were engaged had kind of gotten quiet. Organizations had ceased to exist. And starting to even go to a protest, I remember going to my first protest at the State House when I got here. It was uh, International Women's Day, and I thought there would be this giant protest, and I would meet all sorts of new friends, and there were six people. <laughs> and I was like, huh, maybe this is part of the problem. But also what happened really quickly is I started having um, organizations, even like the Topeka Community uh, Center for Peace and Justice, I had older leaders who approached me and asked me to come be a part of things. I had people who started pulling me into efforts, teaching me what nonprofit boards are, teaching me different aspects of organizing, the history of wins and losses that happened throughout the state. Um, and so that's one thing I also want to recommend to everyone is really the work of organizing is the work of bringing people into. It's building a community, seeing people, seeing their potential, and bringing them in, and sometimes kind of uh, you know, prodding them or force, forcefully pulling them in, because it is scary to get involved in this kind of work, to stand up and speak out for the first time, to knock a door for the first time. That is terrifying if you've never done it. And frankly, it's even a little terrifying if you haven't done it for two years and you're about to do it again. Uh, but so as I got more and more involved in the, in the state and protesting on different issues, really on showing up for other people, which is something I came to understand is you can't ask other people for help if you're not willing to give the help yourself first. You show up for other people and then they show up for you intuitively. It can't be a transaction. Again, you're building a community. But then the 2014 election happened, and I was pretty surprised by all of the results, as I'm pretty sure uh, many people here were, uh, when Governor Brownback had won by just over, it was around 20, 30,000 votes. What we would later come to understand is that that election happened under unconstitutional voter suppression. That was when they had the documentary proof of citizenship where you had to provide a certified copy of your birth certificate. And lo and behold, there were about 35,000 Kansans about the margin of victory had been blocked from voting in that election. And that went all the way to the US Supreme Court, right? That went through the appeals court. That was an unconstitutional voter suppression. So the 2014 election, the election that this organization was founded to fight for, it happened under unconstitutional voter suppression. And it's important because sometimes it feels like, well, why aren't we winning? And it's because some people are not playing on a fair field. So this work of trying to get people engaged, uh, in 2015, Loud Light was founded with a key goal of trying to get young people to vote. Because that voter suppression law, it didn't apply to people who were already registered. Really, they, they liked the people who were voting in 2010. They just didn't want anyone new to start voting. And so it had only applied to new people who got registered. So we started going around, uh, running around on college campuses, registering voters. Um, actually, one person who contacted me and used to run around um, and register people on college campuses was Sharice Davids, who would later go on to be a congresswoman. Um, but also, you know, I'm, I'm a queer person, I'm bisexual. Part of this fight to me was fighting for my right to live my life as a full person, as who I was. And I think um, it's kind of interesting being, I think, maybe the only uh, man who's speaking here, but I think there's a certain solidarity between LGBTQ people and the fight for women's rights because it's people who often are targeted just because of who they are and are undermined by people in power. <laughs> so with this, though, as we started to register more and more people, started to engage more young people, doing the videos, the recap, it happened because I was asking young people, I was like, um, you know, these races, these state legislative races, they're being won by a couple of votes, and they're like, what's a state legislature? <laughs> Most people don't understand that the state isn't just run by the governor. In fact, the governor is just kind of the final check on that and kind of the steering, the, the, you know, the speaker, the direction. It's the state legislature. That's what decides everything. And for the last decade, we had a supermajority Republican state legislature. So I started realizing, wow, we have to explain to people what's happening because you don't know what you don't know. And you won't find out until someone tells you about it or exposes you to that. So that's when we started doing weekly recap videos. 
started explaining to people like what was the budget crisis, started empowering people so that they would actually have agency to engage in these topics so that they could actually feel empowered to be a part of that process, to go have those conversations. Um, from 2014 to 2018, uh, again, you know, in part because of our work, in part because of ksvotes.org, which made the fastest way to register to vote, actually, I think, in the entire country, an amazing tool, um, in part because of so many things, but we actually had the largest increase in youth voter registration and turnout in the entire country from 2014 to 2018. <laughs> and what happened in 2018? Well, as I said, uh, you know, for me personally, Brownback had attacked LGBTQ people over and over. And I wanna also let y'all know that often those random executive orders that he would do attacking LGBTQ people, attacking immigrants, they often happened on the exact same day or week that reports were coming out about how his tax experiment had devastated the economy and the state. And this is a tactic that isn't unique to Kansas, I used to do work also in Uganda and other countries around the world. Authoritarian leaders will do that. They attack minority groups or groups without as much political power to try to cover up and distract from their own failures. But in 2018, we not only saw Sharice Davids, a Native American lesbian, win a congressional seat, our first LGBTQ uh, federal representative in Kansas, and also one of the first two Native American women in history to serve in Congress. We also saw Susan Ruiz and Brandon Woodard, a gay man and a lesbian woman, get elected to the state legislature the first time in history. So for me, when I think of hope and what organizing for political action, what's at stake? You know, I came here a terrified 22-year-old queer person, and there had never been any sort of representation, and then five years later, we're making history on a state level and nationally. We're inspiring people all across the country and political organizing at its best can turn that. Uh, you know, Sharice Davids, I say she's not just a Congress, uh, Congresswoman from Kansas. If you talk to any queer person throughout the Midwest, she's their Congress person because that's why representation matters. You feel like, you don't just feel like you have a voice at the table. You get to be a part of that. So on this, uh, before I pass it over and before we get into questions, I also want to just mention that getting to 2018, that was an incredible feat. And then what happened immediately following that, we see new waves of voter suppression, new waves of efforts to undermine democracy. You know, we have the gerrymandered state and congressional maps just passed, which did unbelievably, you know, terrible and racist things like slice Wyandotte County across along racial lines. These are things that they're doing because they know they cannot win on a fair playing field. Because the people in Wichita, the people in Kansas, in fact, the people across the United States are, states are good and decent people. And the only reason we see terrible politics and terrible policies is because they block the true view of democracy from being seen. And so for all of us, it's about how do we build up that democracy. And it's not just voting. Voting is often actually that step after you get engaged. It's building community and showing people, teaching them why it's worth getting engaged, how you translate that into power. Good afternoon, everybody. How's everybody doing today? <laughs> It's such an honor to be here with a lot of great group of leaders. I can't tell you what a privilege and honor it is, especially because I'm Jeanette Vasquez and I am from Southwest Kansas. And so sometimes I feel like we kind of get left out. <laughs> so anytime we have an invitation to anything, I try to make us present and I try to put us on the map, but it's truly just a great honor to be here. My name is Jeanette Vasquez and I am a liberal city commissioner. For those of you that don't know where liberal is, we're... <laughs> Pretty far, we're about four hours away. We're about a minute from Oklahoma, 10 minutes from Texas, and about an hour from Colorado. So kind of right by that panhandle area. If you show up to Liberal, it also smells kind of weird on Wednesdays, most people tell me. 
But most people also tell me that's also the smell of money. We have the meat packing plants. And that's really what has drawn a growth and economic growth and population growth in Southwest Kansas, Dark City, Liberal Garden. I, when I speak of Southwest Kansas, I kind of talk about all three because we all have very similarities. And so it's truly just an honor, like I said, to be here and represent Southwest Kansas. To tell you a little bit about me, and I always kind of like to share my story because it's really what was my passion and what drove me to run for office. It's kind of funny because most people tell me, Jenna, stop sharing your immigrant story. People, like throughout my whole campaign, everybody told me not to share my story because I'm gonna lose votes and I'm not gonna win. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm all about transparency and I'm also not gonna hide my identity and who I am. And so I'm proud to say, <laughs> I'm proud to say I'm the first elected Latina in liberal Kansas, but we did a little bit more research and I'm actually the first elected Latina in Western Kansas. We have, <laughs> we have Blanca Soto who was appointed by the group of commissioners, but actually elected at large. I was told that I was the first one. And I don't say it in terms of bragging, I say it in terms of it's an honor. And it actually also makes me very emotional because I know that I'm paving the way for a lot of women. I can't tell you after I won, I went to so many elementary schools and I went and I spoke to little girls and so many little girls' eyes and of all races, but their eyes just truly lit up and it inspired them. And that, that to me was just a win. But when I first decided to launch um, and decide to run, of course we all wanna win, but my goal was to get more people to vote. Um, because in my community, we have very low turn of road out. Um, I used to be a reporter, and we have the same issue, Dark City Garden Liberal. Um, our census is about 19,000 people, that's what the census says, but in reality, there's still a lot of people who are scared to fill out the census. So I wanna say we have about 20 to 21,000 people. You're gonna have your bunch of people who are scared. So for my last election, we had 8,952 registered voters but we only had 1,669 actually come out and vote. Now I know that sounds low, but for us that was actually a huge win because we actually had 18% of registered voters come out and vote. Historically in the past, we've only had about 13% of people come out and vote. And so I know it doesn't sound, but for us 5% was a huge win. And I truly think it's because people were ready for a change. I feel like we actually had some competition and we had a great group of individuals who the larger population could identify themselves. Now we know Southwest Kansas has large groups of Latinos, um, but at the end of the day, I feel like they've never had a candidate that they can identify themselves with. And I'm not saying this because I'm Latina myself. I'm saying this that they can identify themselves with in a lot of aspects. Somebody who's approachable, somebody who will actually sit down and listen to their needs, somebody who will talk to them on their level. I feel like that was a huge role in my campaign. I know we wanna sound fancy, we wanna use big vocabulary, but at the end of the day, where the biggest lesson I've learned is you have to meet people at their level. You have to talk to them in the way that they understand and you have to educate them. I can't tell you how many times I went door knocking and I'm like, hi, I'm Jeanette, I'm running for a liberal city commissioner. And they're like, what's that? <laughs> they're like, well, we know you're the girl in a white dress on a poster, but we don't really know what you're doing. And so in Southwest Kansas, we have a lot of work to do. There's still a large population of people who don't understand the importance of voting. They don't understand what these positions are. And at the end of the day, like I said, it just comes down to we have to meet them where they are at their educational level. And we also, like for example, I'm a city commissioner and I have a lot of people, they know I'm a city commissioner, but they don't know what I do. So they're like, well, that's awesome and that's cool, but what exactly do you do? <laughs> so we've created a lot of infographics and personalize it in very basic terms that educates our community what exactly city commissioner, what a county commissioner is, and then going higher. But to tell you guys a little bit about as to why I decided to run, because I actually get told a lot, well, you don't look like a regular politician. <laughs> I get that comment all the time. They're like, well, you're Hispanic, you're young, you're a woman. And I'm like, I get all that. But there, there's a lot of reasons of why I wanted to run. One, to inspire people. It doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter where you come from. If you have a passion in your heart to make change, then you need to run. You really need to run. 
So I came as a little girl. My parents immigrated to the United States when I was two years old. And I don't know why ever since I was a little girl, I remember starting kindergarten. I just had this passion where I wanted to fit in in the United States. I wanted, I wanted my parents to fit in. Um, went through the school system. It's still a little bit hard for me to talk about my story because, I mean, it's been a difficult journey for me. I didn't just magically. <laughs> but I feel like all of those life experiences are what have shaped me who I am today. Graduated from high school there. Well, unfortunately, uh, there was an attorney in Liberal who promised my dad, my family was undocumented, and they promised my dad that they would be able to get him his residency and ultimately citizenship. Well, in the end, Mexico doesn't qualify for a political asylum, so the whole thing was a scam. So we got scammed about $60,000, which was my dad's whole life savings. And I share this not to be judged, but I share this for you to be empathetic, because this is the reality of a lot of families in Southwest Kansas. And so my family got scammed about $60,000, and then my dad was given a deportation order. Well, unfortunately, when I started my first year in college, which was also you know, a learning experience for me, I was a first generation student, you know, just learning the basics. Nobody in my family had gone to college. And so I was in the process of learning how to get accepted. And then I want to say probably like a week after I started college, um, I got a phone call from my dad, and they said ICE came to pick my father up. And at that point, my mother was undocumented, and I have three younger sisters, and well, at the time, I was the only one who could work. So at that point, I was financially responsible for my mother and my three younger sisters, because they were all 10 years and younger. So it was a really difficult process. I had to get another job. I had to finish. I started at the community college. And then there came a point where I had to make a very difficult decision. Do I drop out of college, and do I help my family? Or do I just try to make ends meet and work as many jobs as possible and transfer to Wichita State and find a way to still protect my mom and my sisters? So I made a difficult decision to come to Wichita State University, but it was tough. I didn't get that traditional student experience. I actually had to work three jobs and go to school full time. And I remember during the whole process of when my dad got deported, I was trying to find resources like who can help me? Please, you know, I'm trying to get through college, and it seemed like everywhere I went, like I just got like a slam, like a, everyone just slammed the door shut, like, like it was some kind of negative connotation that I came to ask for help because my family was undocumented. And see, at the end of the day, I'm like, a piece of paper does not determine mine and my family's worth because at the end of the day, that's all the that's the difference. That's the difference between my family and yours that we don't have that piece of paper. My parents tried to do things the right way, but unfortunately, with this broken immigration system, there was no way for my family to get their residency and their citizenship. And so I ended up graduating. It was tough. Like I said, I was supporting my three younger sisters, but I ended up doing it anyways. And I have a five-year-old little boy. I was living in Wichita for some time, but I decided it was time to go back home with my family. And I saw that there were a lot of families who were going through the same thing. Unfortunately, at that time, our police department was working very closely with ICE, and so I just heard of a lot of families being broken. And I understand ICE duties, federal duties, but in my heart, I'm like, that's not something that our local police department should have to enforce. Along with that, I was a news reporter, and I was doing multiple stories in Southwest Kansas of how our immigrant populations were terrified of ICE. Because unfortunately, there was a mafia who was taking advantage of immigrants, and they were vulnerable and causing crimes against immigrants, and immigrants refused to call the police because they were scared. So at that point, that's when I decided I have to come and speak to city commission meetings because there has to be a separation of the police department. Let ICE come in and do their deportations, but there's no reason why our police departments should be doing that enforcement. A lot, we don't have the manpower, and two, they have the resources to carry on that themselves. And so a lot of immigrants were terrified of the police department. And so that's where I felt it was my duty to come in and talk to city commissioners. Well, I remember I went to one meeting and they just looked at me like I was crazy. <laughs> they just looked at me like, what are you doing here and why are you talking about this? And so I felt very disrespected. I felt like they didn't take the time of days to listen to my needs. And these were not just my needs, these were my community needs. And we have a lot of vulnerable voices, a lot of vulnerable populations. And so in my heart, I felt it was my duty, even though I'm not going to lie, I was scared. <laughs> I was scared to go in and talk to a group of politicians because I had never been exposed to any of that. But I was terrified. But in my heart, I'm like, it's my duty to protect these families. And so after I basically 
they didn't pay attention to me, that's when I was like, you know what? You're not gonna listen to me, then I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna get a seat at the table. <laughs> and so, <laughs> that's exactly what I did. So after that, I just used my passion for helping these families. I came back, I decided to run. They used a lot of tactics to scare me away. But I'm like, I'm not, you're not gonna intimidate me. I know exactly where my heart is and I know that I wanna protect as many people as possible. And I mean, they took down my yard signs. They called me and I've never felt racism in my life, to be honest, until I launched my campaign. I had a lot of calls. I've heard of stories, but personally, I'm like, I've never had that happen to me. And I had it happen to me. I had a lot of calls. I had calls in the middle of the night of people being racist, threatening me telling me, basically making me feel like I'm not qualified. And if anything, I'm like, sir, I am more than qualified. Let me tell you all my credentials, but I'm not gonna have this conversation. And so at the end of the day, I, the lessons learned is that don't let intimidation get to you because they're gonna try. They're gonna try to intimidate you. Two, you really have to meet people at their level. And surprisingly, I went back and I looked at the numbers and I was actually elected the statistics said Republicans 50 years or older. And so at the beginning, they told me that I was gonna lose my votes if I shared who I was because I come from an immigrant family, but I'm not gonna change my identity and I'm not gonna change who I am and I'm also not gonna come around and give you this sugar-coated story when I am true to who I am and I ran for a reason and I'm going to keep my purpose. Thank you. But All right, it's time. Oh, did you have no, more? No, no, Okay. I was just going to say, but the best recommendation I can have is if you have a passion in your heart and you want to change something, don't think about it, just run. The rest will all come. Yeah. Amen. All right, if you have questions, let's write them down and start holding them up, and some of my colleagues will grab those, and we will commence. Okay. Okay, so let's start with this one could be for all of you, okay? So, let's see. How important is it for voters to see someone from their community as the person who's do door knocking or phone calling? So, in other words, can white volunteers help spread the word in a non-white community? Go ahead, Jana. Yeah. Yes, most definitely. So, I want to say the majority of my volunteers were white. Um, like I said, at the end of the day, it doesn't have so much to do with race. It just has to do with the passion and the energy and the way you approach people. Like I said, let's not make it more complicated than it needs to be. At the end of the day, you just need to be genuine and you need to be transparent. And the people who are helping you also have to have those same ideals. But at the end of the day, I would say the majority of my volunteers were. Like, so I don't, I think at the end of the day in Southwest Kansas, we're all just a large community. Yes, we have different demographics, but basically just find people who are genuine, who are true and are, who are ready to do the hard work. Davis or Barbara? Yeah. I just would agree and just say it's getting the people there. Uh, it is very important for people to know that the candidate is out doing the work. Uh, and uh, in my own experience as a state legislator, I did most of my own canvassing because people wanted to talk to me. But I had other people doing many other things, particularly sending postcards out. Uh, in my race for US Senate, I will say the other side didn't have nearly the support or mon monetary support that I did from real people. Yes, they did from corporations and you know that dark money. <laughs> but bottom line is, uh, they did use a lot of postcards and it appears to be very effective. So um, when you hear about can you write postcards to support a candidate or an idea, please participate and get them <laughs> out to people. It does make a difference. I, I would agree and I'll contrast a little bit to say 
I think especially for people who have never been engaged in the political process in this world um, of these types of things, it can be much more approachable and helpful for them to have someone like them approach them for the first time. And I, you know, we do this where, you know, let's say it's, we're going canvassing in a neighborhood and there's an apartment complex that is, you know, it's a uh, mixed use, like predominantly Hispanic and Latina apartment complex. Well, I don't speak Spanish, right? And also, I just want to be completely real. This might be an apartment complex that a lot of white men don't often come along unless there's an issue. Right. And so I might not be the best ambassador to go there and start knocking on doors uh, to talk to people. And it might be better for someone who's in, for me to instead do what I can to help empower someone who is engaged, you know, from that building, from that community, to instead give them the resources and support so that they can go talk to their peers about why they care and then they get brought in because this is you know if it's if it's race or age or whatever there there are differences between you know different cultures and and age right I, i'm gonna be real it was mentioned that we're on tiktok y'all i don't really know how to use tiktok <laughs> oh apparently i'm on tiktok but that's some some other people that we work with that will like edit the videos and put it on it right and i'll even i'll be like that damn tiktok when i really like, <laughs> and so there's like some just some cultural differences for different communities where sometimes we aren't the best person to go in and help to bring people in but what we can all do is help to find the people who do want to be that ambassador and make sure they have the resources to do that work yeah. and if i could add one more part about prairie roots that's what deep canvassing is about we want people from their local neighborhoods to be involved with their neighbors that's how it's effective, to be able to go to a door and say, I live in your neighborhood, and I want to know what matters to you, and we can figure out together how we can make that happen. So um, when, when, if you volunteer at Prairie Roots, you're going to be put in areas with, that you're familiar with and they know you, not this random, you know, whoever's out there just doing whatever. That's how you really establish relationships people that are part of your community, it does make a difference. All right, this is, this is for everyone. And if anyone has an answer, we're gonna be so excited. How do we stop gerrymandering? <laughs> the answer is very simple. We elect different yeah. people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and yes, we are stuck now for 10 years, and by God, we have, we don't need to wait for 10 years to get it to flip. Right. It can be done. So let's get to work and make that happen. Go good. Well, <laughs> yeah. Ooh, this is like a sore spot right now, y'all. Um, so we were, we were plaintiffs in the gerrymander lawsuits, heavily involved in both the state and congressional lawsuits. Um, and again, as I, as I mentioned before, I mean, those maps are pretty atrocious. And they really stack the deck and make the work harder. Again, it's not impossible, but it is a lot harder um, and one of the things that's frustrating about gerrymandering, too, isn't just about, you know, one side getting advantage. It's that even in some of the, the state maps, what they did is they kind of solidified both parties' things, which means that really the fewer districts are competitive. And we all know that competitive races, they increase turnout yeah. because it means that candidates and organizations and everyone else is investing resources. People go to places when they think it's exciting and a change can happen. And that becomes harder whenever the districts become kind of pre-configured. Um, and there's some, who again, uh, I was pretty surprised that our state Supreme Court upheld both maps, although they have not yet explained that. They said those rulings and explanations would come later, um, which is a frustrating thing in itself. Um, but to really change this, one thing that we have in Kansas, one challenge we have that other states don't, or not all states have, is we don't have a ballot process, right? The only time we get to vote on constitutional amendments is if two thirds of both chambers, two thirds of the House Senate and uh, two thirds of the House and two thirds of the Senate put it before people. You know, in a lot of other states, you can go collect signatures. That's how, you know, Missouri has an anti-gerrymandering thing in their constitution. Well, the people could put it there. We don't have that right. And so the only way that we can change a lot of stuff at the state level 
is to flip the state house and state senate seats. That is our avenue, what we have to do. So there's not some like lucky workaround. It's changing the politicians who are there. And then maybe we can get decent politicians who do want to make anti-gerrymandering things in our constitution or pass statutes that put in place an independent commission like the governor called for. So it would be a nonpartisan commission trying to respect the local communities when they draw the districts. Um, but you know we have hard work, but the past clear, and there's no shortcuts here. Like the legislature has to change. Well, I don't want to. Basically, I want to echo on what Dr. Boiler and he said. But I feel like at the end of the day, for Southwest Kansas, we just need to get our numbers higher. Yeah. There, there's a lot of people who don't come out and vote, and until we start getting more people to come out and vote, we're gonna have, we're not gonna have any change. And so, for me, it would just be working closely within your own hometown and your surroundings, tell all your friends and family. It's the basic things that we're not doing. Awesome, all right, I'm gonna do a few that are individual here. So Davis, this may piggyback over what you were just saying. How's the voting rights ACLU effort going? So uh, on organizing, organizing has taken lots of paths from knocking doors and running around uh, to speaking at protests and running around uh, before they live streamed video in the state house. I used to run around with a camera and scared the crap out of, I think, state representatives when I'd set up my little camera in the corner. Um, but uh, one of the paths that it has taken increasingly in the last several years is, is litigation, is lawsuits. Um, I was like, I, I was almost going to ask which one because we're involved in like six lawsuits or something now. Um, so we have the gerrymander lawsuits that you just heard about that are, you know, we know that they didn't go in our favor. We don't know exactly the logic behind that. Um, the first uh, lawsuit was around open records data, and this is actually around provisional ballots, and this is whenever they think there's a reason your ballot might not be counted, you should cast provisional. Well, for years now, this is a project that we've been working on to get more provisional ballots counted, because a lot of these ballots, there's really no reason not to count them. Right. Um, and luckily, we've made a lot of progress. Um, actually, before the 2020 election, for the previous three or four years, the legislature had actually been making incremental progress to actually expand voting rights, improve our system. Um, and we got you know, things like, if they say your signature doesn't match, they have to at least attempt to contact you to give you an opportunity to cure that. That was a big win. They were throwing out thousands of people's ballots without ever even letting them know that they were challenging and throwing out your ballot. Um, but so we have something related to that, but our big one right now is around the impersonating election officials statute. And so after 2020 happened, you know, the big lie happened, which unfortunately Derek Schmidt was involved in trying to overturn an election um, and, and, and all that. And we've seen this just wave of bizarre voter suppression laws. And when I say like bizarre, you have them up there and we will lay out all the facts explaining how there's no reason to justify this law. It will block you know, people with disabilities from voting or whatever. And then they'll just be like, well, it just feels like we need it. <laughs> and I'm like, how do you combat that, right? Like, how do you combat this where like facts do not, like explicitly and aggressively do not matter to some of these people. Um, but on this, they passed a law that says, if anyone thinks you're an election official because of the activity you're engaged in, you can be charged with a felony. Well, we've done voter registration. It's not uncommon for people to ask us, oh, hey, are you with the election office, right? Because they just, why, why would you, you know, most people just assume that. It's not uncommon. Well, now that potentially opens us to being thrown in jail for that. And so for now, nearly a year, we've had most of our voter, re like all of our voter registration public events suspended. Um, we thought the judge would immediately rule on it before it went into effect. Last June, we asked for an emergency injunction. Um, a Brownback appointed district judge sat on the case for so long, it was incredibly frustrating. Um, then finally, late last year, gave us a ruling and ruled against us in what I would call a nonsensical manner. Just a, it did not make sense. And then we've been at the appeals court, and now we actually argued in front of the appeals court in any day now. So, I mean, what I hope, I, you know, I hope it's on Monday morning, but any day now courts can take their sweet time if they want to. Um, but hopefully we'll get a clear answer that this law is not blocking people from being registered. Um, and I do wanna say one part about that that's been frustrating too, is that part of the reason we're being cautious is that, you know, 
Chris Kobach is running for attorney general, and you can go back and prosecute people. So there's a chance that Kobach could say, well, these people at this event in 2021, we had reports that they thought that they were election officials, so now I'm going to charge them with felonies. Chris Kobach, a man who has already a documented record of violating the U.S. Constitution to suppress voters, um, and has charged you know, tons of people for like accidents with, with crimes. So that's a real fear, and we're hopeful that the appeals court will rule very soon so that we can get back to registering voters. Okay, awesome. And throw in, his name is Chris Mann, who's running for attorney general on the progressive side. Yeah. Okay, Janet, this one's for you. What recommendations do you have for immigrants that want to run for elected office? Well, the first thing, the first recommendation is just run. Just fill out the paperwork. I know it's a scary process. I mean, when I first thought of running, I'm like, but I don't know how to do I don't know what process. I don't know the rules. I don't know the regulations. I feel like you just have to do it, and everything else will come along. And don't be afraid to ask for help, because I know I struggle with that myself. Sometimes I just don't want to make it seem like I don't know what I'm doing, so I was scared to ask for help. But you will make your life a lot easier if you just ask for help. But like I said, at the end of the day, it just starts with the step. Just file, just run, just do it. Okay. I love it. All right, Barbara, what are the top five flippable districts that Prairie Roots is targeting? And can you also tell us where they are? I don't know who else is in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to let you know, holler at us, and we'll talk to you. Because... You can give out too much really great information, and then everybody else knows, and then they know that they need to get their people out. Ah. So no ah. offense, Got no. but just let us know. And, and when you volunteer, we'll let you know. And, but I, don't, I, I just really don't want to put that out there right now, other than know that they are, and you can figure it out. Didn't someone, who won by, oh, let's just give an example. Representative Steve Becker lost by... Seven votes? Seven votes. Anybody with any sense knows it's probably a pretty close to flippable district, right? <laughs> okay, that would be a start. Um, but, and what was the other part of the question? Oh, just what were the top five flippable districts? Oh, okay. Where are they? Yeah. Well, and they're, they're out there and, and we know, but it doesn't mean, um, I'm going to give an example from the past that no one thought, um, uh, just even whether it, it's flippable, whether it, whatever party someone's in. My friend Jan Kessinger, uh, former representative now, but he was running against former representative Rob Bruckman. Everyone said to Jan, don't run. You can, no one can be Rob Bruckman. That will never happen. And he called me. I'd known him from church. I said, absolutely run. Whoever said it, if you have a passion and want change, put your name out there because people will respond to you and it can change even though nobody knew that it was a flippable district. Uh, as we have learned in your area, what the numbers say and what actually happened aren't always the same thing. So as she has said and he has said and I have said, run or get others running. We need people on the ballot. Yeah. Okay, I think this could apply to all of you, but it was written to Davis, so maybe we'll start with Davis. What are the biggest hurdles to getting young people mobilized and registered to vote? So on, um, on voter registration, I think there's an important thing that we forget, which is that voter registration is a barrier. In most developed democracies, voter registration does not exist. It doesn't exist. The government knows if you're eligible to vote, right? right? It's, it's automatic in increasing number of states in the United States. Like voter registration is a barrier to voting, period. Even if it's simple to do it, it is a barrier to voting. And then it's also a barrier because then you don't show up in the data and then candidates don't know to contact you or nonprofit organizations and other things. Um, so I also think that people often forget their own journey to becoming civically engaged, which for me, for example, I am lucky enough to have had parents that used to even check me out of school on election day and take me with them to the voting booth 
where I think they even had, in my town, they had little hot dog and hamburgers ballots for like kids and stuff. And I got, and, I, and my parents would then take me to lunch and sit down and talk about why we vote, right? It's not like it just happened. Like, I think that's part of why I am who I am. And when I turned, uh, I turned 18, my first election was the 2008 election, which was obviously a huge election and there was lots of excitement around it. So there are reasons that I think I ended up being as obsessed with this topic. <laughs> as I think I am, um, but people forget that there was usually um, an adult in their life that explained the process to them and, and really kind of held their hand through it, right? There's so many barriers to even getting registered. Like, people are intimidated, right? On, on that registration even says, if you make a mistake because of a law that Kobach passed, uh, it says, if you make a mistake, like this is a felony charge and you'll be in jail, well, you might be like, well, I don't even know if this is worth even taking the risk of filling out this form. Um, so being there to help guide people through it, remembering, meeting people where they are, right? There's no dumb questions. This is an intimidating thing. Remembering that people are even going into the voting booth, right? And this is something I meant to make like a video about for a while, but you know, many of people here have now done it many times. The first time you go into a voting booth and you show up, you don't want to feel stupid. And so some people straight up do not go vote because they're like, I've never done it, and I don't know what I do when I walk in and do it. I don't know who to walk up to. I'm scared to do it. What if I make a mistake? I've been that person in the voting booth where you show up and I'm like, I did not know I was able to vote on that school board race, and I'm like panicking trying to figure out something because you don't want to make a mistake. Um, so just remembering that, that it, it really is a, um, it's a learning process. I know some schools do better than others. I wish we had a more robust program, but every step of the way, you probably take it for granted. And you really need to sit down with people and work through every step of what needs to happen. Remind them about the dates. Check in with them to make sure they registered. You know, go vote early with them is a great way to do it so that you can literally be next to them in the process. Um, but yeah, really, really just remembering that it has to be as simple as possible because it is intimidating, especially the first time you do it. And can I add, it's yeah. not just about young people. It is law that y someone can come with you to vote and help you. I did that once. I was uh, mentoring a family, and I had gone, the, w the, the mom saw my I voted sticker. They do matter. She said, oh, you voted? I said, yes, have you? She goes, nah, I didn't have a ride. And I said, get in the car. And then I'm like, oh yeah, are you registered? <laughs> and she was, and I knew she was a functionally illiterate woman, and so I walked up to the voting booth and said, she needs help. I would like to go in, am I allowed? And absolutely, it is the law. So what we can do as we're working to make sure people are registered and do all this is let them know. If you need help, it is your right to have assistance. And that's just a simple thing. I didn't know that before. Most of us don't know that. And go and vote. So getting that information out matters. Young people are also busy, and we have to meet them in their time frame as well as their issues. Thank you, Governor Kelly, for standing up to legalize marijuana. That is one of the number one issues for young voters. And we need to help them know that if they get out there and vote, we can change who's there and get those things passed. They need their own, and again, it's what we do at Prairie Roots. We meet people where they are what issues matter to them and help them connect the dots. So it may not be my issue or your issue, but it is their issue and let's get them voting. Janeth, anything to add about young people? Well, the only thing I can tell you is I actually went out to the high schools and I actually went out to the elementary schools because I feel like it really comes down to planting that seed at an early age and so. Yeah, I, amen, yeah. Okay, this one's for all of you, too. When people who oppose either, in some cases, our candidacies or the issues that we care about, and they can generate hot-button issues to energize their base, reversing our momentum, how can we start our own hot-button issues to take away their energy? 
create our own sound bites. In other words, it seems like we fail at this, and how can we turn around and level that playing field? <laughs> Anyone want to take that? I might need to reflect on this. I need, need to go journal for a little while. I think, and actually, I'm. This is something I've I've been thinking about too because uh, so we have lots of um, part-time staff and fellows and other stuff that are that are people who are you know 18, 19, 20 years old, and one thing that I think that I'm really proud of and that I think is amazing um, as the light's grown is we've done a better job of actually getting young people to not just you know try to organize on their campus and other stuff, but actually to start to give testimony in the state house. I mean, we had. I mean, dozens of young people going in and, and helping them write, you know, testimony and then actually present it in front of the legislature. And that's a powerful thing if you've never done it. It's terrifying, and then it's very powerful. Um, write op-eds that are getting published in papers um, across the, the state. And um, so anyways, that that's kind of inspired me about how do you, you can change the narrative whenever they write op-eds about like the future they want to see. Actually, one story I love about this that some of y'all might know this person is um, Allie Utley from Allen County, um, mm -hmm. who was actually kind of a, a protege under David Tolan, now the Lieutenant Governor. Um, she is an incredible young woman, and when she was in high school, she approached their local paper and just started writing, it was like a monthly column about youth perspectives on issues. And they were incredible. And, and this is getting out to the community and starting to change how people think about what's possible on a local level. And think about, well, if these are the concerns of young people and we want them to stay in our rural community, maybe we should start listening to them. And maybe we should start having young people come and talk to the, you know, the town council. Um, and I think on that, on a local level, this can be easier to do. I actually, I. You know, one of the first things I'll tell young people whenever I am trying to register them to vote or whatever is they'll be like, well, my vote doesn't matter. And I'm like, your vote doesn't matter for president, right? I'm like, we're in Kansas. Your vote doesn't matter for president. And then they kind of pause, right? Because, you know, part of my language, but then they finally realize, they're like, oh, you're not trying to bullshit me, right? I'm telling you, it's not going to matter here. And I'm like, but did you know there's a state representative? Here's what that is. And the one here only won by 50 votes, and they're deciding your tuition, they're deciding your debt, they're deciding that if your friend gets caught smoking weed that they're gonna go to jail whenever if they were you know, a couple hundred miles the other way, it wouldn't even matter, right? Like these things that are impacting your life are being decided by these close margins, and that starts to change what they think is possible. Um, so I definitely think it's, you know, it's a local level, and again, it, it happens better at a community level and by word of mouth than in these kind of sound bites. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Barbara, yeah? I mean, this is complicated because they take an issue and don't tell the truth. I'm going to say that again. They don't tell the truth about things that are difficult to talk about. I had the advantage when I'm a physician. I taught sex education for years, years. So abortion is about sex education. But who talks about... We watch sex, we read about it, we see pictures on and on, but we don't talk about it because it's private and personal. But we're gonna have to talk about these things. We have to say the word abortion. We have to understand that we deserve our liberty as women, our autonomy, our choice, and we just are gonna have to get out there. And I wish that it was different. I don't know that you can go out and make it up. I'm not willing to go down to that level. But this orange jacket, that is a statement. That is a hot button issue. And if there is nothing else out there, I am tired of them using this excuse about guns. Keep the Second Amendment, but there are things we can do to make it safe and give us our right to life and our children their right to their lives. <laughs> yeah. 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 I agree.
it would be really nice if we could really just value them both. Um, I've been using that a lot lately. Okay. Um, Janeth, do you have anything you want to add about uh, ways, I mean, since you've run for office, how you sort of combated these hot button issues or sort of short sound bites in order to get elected? I just tuned them out. <laughs> At the end of the day, I just tuned them out. I don't let, I don't take things personally because I'm very sure of who I am and of all of my accomplishments and where my heart is. And so at the end of the day, don't focus on the negative energy, just focus on the positivity. And I think that will speak volumes about who you are and what you're really trying to accomplish. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Davis. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to stop the round of applause for that. <laughs> so one thing that I want to add to this is that I think there's this uh, sometimes perception like, well, if there was just a better message on this, if just this happened, like, why are we losing? And they forget, like, you are winning, right? Like, you are winning. And let's look at the abortion amendment, right? So first off, they put it in August, which there are even conservative Republicans in the legislature who spoke out about this, like, this is ridiculous. Like, we are explicitly doing this to make sure that the people of Kansas don't vote on it because they know in a general election there is no way in hell this amendment would pass. So they have now rigged it to this way that actually, uh, oh gosh, I forgot his name. He only served one term. He was an old farmer, I think, from Western Kansas. He was a very concerned. Panbacker. Panbacker. Representative Panbacker. Older farmer from Western Kansas. He comes in there extremely conservative. Extremely conservative. And he got up on the floor and he goes, I would rather be a one-term politician than a dishonest one. And he voted against it because he said it cannot be in August. He said if it's in November, let the people vote. But putting it in August is not letting the people vote. And, that, and he did, and then he got ousted. You know, I don't even think he tried to run again because they were Kansas for Life was ready to come for him after that. Um, <laughs> But in Senator Pio, who I think voted for it, he spoke out against it too. Again, extremely conservative people who understood, wow, we are trying to break democracy to force these things because people do not support it. The other thing I want to mention about the voter suppression bill that we're in lawsuits on, the impersonating an official bill all, that also included the provision that now makes it so instead of helping your neighbors return their mail ballots, you can only assist up to 10 people per election, and then it's a crime after that, which is a made-up number. I mean, this was all made up. They had no facts to back up why they were doing this. Um, I kid you not, it was at the time Blake uh, Carpenter was the chairman, the House chairman of the Elections Committee. And he's, you know, I know he's from this area. And he was, uh, he on the Senate, so it passed the legislature, the governor vetoed it, and then it went to override. And it had passed, already been overridden in the House, and now the only obstacle is overriding in the Senate. Blake Carpenter was sitting next to the Kansans for Life lobbyist as they voted to, pat, to override the governor to pass this voter suppression thing. So if you don't believe that anti-abortion sentiment and this kind of fascist sentiment is intimately connected to voter suppression, they not only put it in the August ballot, they've tried to suppress the vote overall in Kansas because they know they are losing. You are already winning. Okay, our last question for this panel. Could each of you tell us what you're going to be doing between now and elections in August and November um, related to the issues that are important to you? Barbara? <laughs> I, I am not going on vacation. I live on vacation now, and I am working so hard, my husband is like, when are you going to let this go? <laughs> Never. <laughs> I am a woman. And it's always going to be there. So what am I doing? I talk to people all the time. Anybody that looks like they may be anything to do with Kansas, whether I'm in Kansas or out of Kansas, or they might know somebody in Kansas, I'm not kidding. I talk to everybody about this. Because Kansas is the first state, once the road decision comes out, we are the first place in the nation that's going to be voting as a state on whether we keep this right or not, which will influence our entire country. So everyone in the United States of America needs to care about this. 
I call people at least three days a week, just like I'm back in my campaign. And I'm telling you, that isn't easy. Calling people cold, asking them to participate and give money. But you know what, I, like I said earlier, all they can say is no. That's it. It doesn't hurt me. And anybody I connect with and I can get them to help, it matters. So I want you, we talked at lunch about what are you going to do? Make a plan, not just to vote, but what you're going to do once a week or once a day or once a month. I don't care what amount of time you have. There is nothing more important than August of this year. There will always be, every election is important. But if we don't make those changes and you don't commit, do not come August 3rd and go, I wish, or if only, and get others. There aren't enough of us here to make that difference, but there are enough of us here that know 10 people that know 10 people that know 10 people and can make the difference. And I know, I'm always af afraid, oh my gosh, what if they're on the other side? Well, you know what, they'll just tell me. <laughs> All right, but I'm, like last night, I was at Riverfest, and there I am in line. So, do you know that there's a constant, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I was, uh, Peyton knows, I was do it. You have to speak about it. And I wouldn't have even expected who I s spoke to necessarily. I didn't know what side they're on. And I just say, it doesn't matter. Find out the facts. And if you want to keep birth control in this state, know that. There is nobody except these crazy people that don't want to have birth control. I'm sorry. It just doesn't happen. And I know I'm not speaking against a church. There are reasons. But most people, even in that church, still use birth control. And we need to keep this. So don't be afraid and get out and make this happen. Make a plan. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Um, okay, so leading into November, yes, of course, the August Amendment um, it always feels like there's like a daunting deadline and then another daunting deadline um, it is huge in so many ways. And I think one of the biggest obstacles there and one of the reasons they put it on there is, uh, you know, one third of Kansas voters are unaffiliated, uh, which means they have never voted right. in August. Right. So even people that you think are hyper involved, it's remember, do not take anything for granted. You might have someone who's, I vote every election, every election all the time, but they've never been allowed to vote in their August election because it's a primary, which is also just a little language thing. We generally say it's a special election. There's an August special election, right? Where everyone's voting on it. It's not just a primary. Right. Um, but so leading up to that, we're going to be, we're hoping that we get a ruling really quick so that we can do a lot more voter registration before the uh, July 12th last day to register to vote. Um, but then even beyond that, we do tons of voter contact about get out the vote. Um, and then even as we get to, you know, we kind of have these cycles where you can really push people to ask for a mail ballot. Um, so getting the mail ballot is a great way also that you can check in with people, you can help them request it, and then you can call them back. And then if they see anything that they don't understand on their ballot, this is a great time too, because then they can talk to you about it instead of freak out in the voting booth. Um, and then you have early voting and you can help people get to that. And all these stages, we kind of, what we think of it as a funnel. We're trying to funnel down like our universe of possible people to vote. And you want as many as possible to vote by mail. Then you want as many as possible to vote early. So that then when we get to election day, we have a smaller universe of people that were actually, who haven't voted yet. Um, and that's how you should think about it with all your friends and you should scold them if they didn't vote early uh, or by mail. Um, but then after that, that actually, this is when another part of our work begins is on election day and even on early voting, Loud Light is partnering with the ACLU of Kansas to do voter protection work. And so you can sign up you know, at loudlight.org to volunteer with us and we'll contact you about it. But this is about, um, well, first off, you can be a poll worker also for the state. Your county likely needs poll workers, so you should contact them and be willing to do that. But poll workers can go and you monitor the situation and identify issues. And let's be real here. You know, we're in Wichita where the Summer of Mercy happened. 
there is an extreme likelihood that we're going to see some bizarre stuff happen at polling places this August. And we want election observers to be monitoring the situation so that we can document that. So we can document that if something terrible happens and they try to like you know blockade people from going into the polling place or that they're chanting outside and intimidating voters about how they should vote outside. We need that stuff documented so that we can report it and so that if legal action needs to be taken, it can be taken. Again, we're partnering with the ACLU and also having voter protection hotlines so that if any people encounter issues like being told they're not allowed to vote when they know they are supposed to be allowed to vote, if we have counties telling unaffiliated voters maybe that they're not allowed to vote when we know they're allowed to vote. Um, we're gonna be working on that. And then actually even after election day, uh, obviously working on any issues that we saw there, but then we, tra we chase provisional ballots. We, we get that data. This is some of the other lawsuits that we've been involved with for years is getting the right to access that data so that then we can help contact people and track them down and make sure their votes are counted or identify issues where you know, some role, rogue poll worker decided to try to tell people that they have to cast provisional ballots when they shouldn't have. Um, and there's opportunities for help with all, all of that work. Uh, so if you sign up at loudlight.org, I'm sure we'll have you know, emails going out about all the volunteer opportunities for all the aspects of this work. Yeah, awesome, and Janet? Well, I could probably be here all day if I go into the specifics. I would like to say it's hard work from here until August and November, but the reality is in Southwest Kansas, we have a lot of work to do for years. Uh, we really wanna get that culture change out there, really wanna get our numbers higher. There's no reason why we should only have 18% of people out in Southwest Kansas actually coming out to vote when we have higher numbers of people registered to vote. So I would say for us in Southwest Kansas, it's going to be ongoing work for years, um, but that's not gonna discourage us and we're just gonna keep fighting hard. And if any organizations or anybody wants to come out to Southwest Kansas, definitely get in touch with me and we would be more than happy to have you guys come out. Cause I feel like sometimes that's probably why we get a little bit discouraged. I've heard from a lot of people, well, they don't really care about us out in Southwest Kansas, so why do we even care to vote? It's mostly from Wichita going east, but that's not always the case. And so I feel like the more people we have present in Southwest Kansas, that would really be a huge motivation factor for people to come out and exercise their right to vote. And I think to sum up what they all said, they would be happy to take your time and your funds <laughs> in their organizations, their campaigns, and in their work. So let's thank our panel.